Hey guys, what's up? It is week 360. I have some reviews for you, so let's jump right into this. The first one up is the Bounty Hunter Trilogy from Radiance Films. Been really liking what they're doing lately, and this is probably one of my, if not my favorite release they've done. So, uh, I love Japanese cinema, especially, you know, period pieces when they're kind of like in the, the samurai kind of style deal. So we follow this lead character here. He's a doctor, and he's basically an assassin. He's a, a gun for hire. So he's kind of got a heart of gold. He He's altruistic in a weird way but tough as fucking nails so the first film is uh the kind of the most complicated i think that they kind of simplified the plots later and i think that more inspirations or uh, more influences got into the sequels after they realized they kind of had a hit character on their hands so essentially what happens is our character our lead here is hired to kind of investigate and check out what's happening because there is a a faction of this group of people that want to deal with the dutch um, and this is kind of like when we have like emperors and all those kind of things. So people all kind of have to fall in line. So this, uh, this guy works for the Shogunate and, uh, essentially he wants to go here and make sure that this kind of group of people doesn't separate from the group and cause an all out war. Because when they're dealing with the Dutch, they're trying to look into getting more advanced weapons because at one point in history, Japan was kind of isolated from the entire world. So it's kind of, they're trying to stop them from operating and working with the Dutch. Um, that's just the wishes of the emperor. So essentially he goes in here and he tries to infiltrate this entire group of people. Uh, this one's really good in the fact that there's a lot of twists and turns. He meets a lot of people along the way. At first he meets kind of this, this what you think is like a bumbling idiot. Um, he meets him after he kind of faces off against this entire group of people. And you realize how incredibly badass he is. He completely wipes out everyone that he comes in contact with quickly. Um, and I know it's not exactly realistic, but it's one slice, you're done. Um, and a lot of times in some of the like uh, Kurosawa movies, like there'd be concentration on just like, standing still and then the first move it, it happens quick you know i mean it only takes one false move to get killed by a sword in these movies or a samurai sword but i, I really like the idea because it does feel a lot like the ending of the old west films you know because we have the incorporation of new guns new weapons new technology and that's kind of like the railroad coming through right it completely changes everything now that there's these people with cannons and, and firearms it's not it's no longer the same game so he also runs into this uh, this woman who also has her own uh, vendetta and all these ideas. So what happens is he ends up coming in contact with, of course, infiltrating and getting there and everything. He, at points, he plays like this blind man. And he meets all these characters along the way, and there's twists and turns. And at the end of the movie, there's a lot of people that you don't think are actually who they are. There's a lot of people that are more noble, a lot of people that are more villainous. Overall, this one is really great. I think it's really well made. I think it's vastly entertaining. Uh, I would really recommend this. I don't want to spoil too much. The action's great. The lead character is really what sells this. This guy is so charming and likable, even though he's not always perfect. Um, there's a lot of good moments, too. Like I said, there's bits of comedy. Like when he plays the blind guy, you get some Zatoichi. Not exactly Zatoichi, but you know what I'm saying. I mean, how can you not mention blind swordsman, Japanese cinema, and not think of Zatoichi? But uh, regardless, yeah, this one is Killer's Mission. This is the most complex in terms of plot and deceit and all these characters having ulterior motives after this they kind of get more up front they kind of um kind of feel like a lot of other plots if that makes any sense from other famous movies but i really like this one i this one at first you know i'm always leery about watching box sets back to back because i'm like all oh, these movies are going to be very similar and i'm going to be lost and i'm going to not know which one was which that happens sometimes even in great box sets like the yokai monsters or the damagen sets you watch them and you're like man these are very similar movies even though they're really good they kind of bleed together they're not really meant to watch back to back to back you know they get released over a two three year period and you're supposed to watch them every six months every year not back to back like this but anyways i thought uh, killer's mission was really great all right the next film is the fort of death and this one opens up where you, he's more like a doctor you actually see his kind of uh his 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 backstory a little bit and see that he is more of a heroic type than he was in the previous film because the other film it, it doesn't really establish i don't think that he's more of a doctor character or an, a character that's helping in the very beginning he helps somebody with gonorrhea which is kind of a comedic 
comedic scene. Um, and we have uh, the character from the first one, Kajero, comes back. A different actress, though, unfortunately, but she's still good. So um, this one is more in line with Seven Samurai or The Magnificent Seven, right? That kind of storyline here where this guy wanders in, he's hurt badly, and there is a group of horrible people that rule over these farmers. They take advantage of them. They don't give them enough to eat. Don't give them enough. It's essentially Seven Samurai, right? So they want to hire uh, this the assassin here, our lead character, to kind of protect the village, stand up against these villains. Um, and he brings this kind of ragtag group of people with him. There's like two or three of them. He has, of course, Kajero. Um, I believe that's her name. And a couple others that show up. And right in the beginning, we realize that there's already been some uh, assassins that they've hired. Not necessarily the most trustworthy people or the good people, considering they try to rape one of the villagers almost immediately. And uh, one of his friends, one of his colleagues, puts an end to that. So what we have here is uh, essentially a group of characters that have to stand up to uh, unbeatable force, but they have some tricks up their sleeve. And this is very much Wild Bunch here because the first one was made in 69. Wild Bunch had already come out by the second one being made. So the Wild Bunch holds heavy influence over this. This is very much like a peck and paw style Seven Samurai. And I know what you guys are thinking, you know, that sounds awesome. And it is. It's fucking awesome. So essentially there is uh, some sort of Gatling gun in here. And I find it funny in the first movie they were fighting against the weapons being incorporated into Japan. But here now everybody's just using not everybody but a big handful of people are using them uh so this one overall is is just as good as the first um i don't think it has the complexities as the first film um i think it's more straightforward but i think that it delivers on the goods i think that our character is more established here and um by the third one he's even more established you kind of get this idea that he he's going to do the right thing or what he thinks is the right thing above all even if it goes against direct orders. And it starts to kind of show in this one a bit. But uh, overall, I thought this was a good one. You just know, some, um, very few against many. You've seen it a million times, like I said. No Escape is one. Army of Darkness is another. And of course, Seven Samurai, Magnificent Seven, Battle Beyond the Stars. Um, it's very much in that line, but more of like a more violent uh, Gatlin gun, Peck and Paw, a little bit of style in there. Love this movie. Really great stuff. These both look spectacular as well. All right, the final one in the set is Eight Men to Kill. And at first, this one started off, and I was like, is this one a little less? This one, maybe it's starting to wear out as welcome. I'm not as not as into it. And uh, the character feels fully realized, though, in this one. He's more so, you see more of the doctor side, more of the calm side, more of the good side. Um, and essentially what they do is they hire him because there's been some stolen gold by a group of bandits. And he's supposed to get the gold back and bring it back, and he's going to get a percentage so he can open up a bunch of hospitals and everything like that. They agree to it. So he goes out, and pretty soon he finds out that the main assassin, the main bandit, had been kidnapped. Um, not kidnapped, but arrested. And uh, he goes to kind of get him out, but there's some other assassin that's on the same trail trying to get him out and what happens is this bandit ends up getting executed the other bandit uh is his sister involved and then there's a second in charge who's kind of went the way of like going with a prostitute for that money and everything like that but this prostitute has direct ties with this guy who runs a gold mine and he basically slaves people to work to you know he wants to get rid of them or what whatnot but he sees his you know chance to instead of mining the gold or making people mine the gold to steal the gold but the assassin here has, uh, the bad assassin, I guess I'll say, has some tricks up his sleeve. So we pit these two assassins, these two spies, these two mercenaries against each other trying to get this gold, while we, of course, have this kind of slave driver who has the gold hidden somewhere. So that's kind of the plot of this one. Again, there's a lot of treachery, a lot of people not to be trusted, a lot of people saying who they aren't. But the ending is great. I will say this because there's a kidnapping and of course our hero is going to do the right thing. And the end of this film plays into the fact that, you know, this guy is not going to stand up for any wrongdoings, even if it's initially what he was supposed to do. Um, and, and at times he's going to complete the mission, even if things have changed. I mean, like he, he completes the mission, like kind of similar to like, I just watched zero, uh, woman, red handcuffs, you know, like that Japanese kind of finishing the, doing the right thing. Um, no matter what kind of honor and this character, although he probably goes against traditional honor in a way, he does stand up for the right thing. And this ending gets so fucking dark that, uh, it really pushed it up with the other ones. I think all three of these are spectacular. As far as the special features are concerned, we have audio comments. Commentary by Killer's Mission and author 
Critic Tom Mez, interview with film historian Akado Ito, visual essay by Ichio Kudo by Robin Gatto, series posters and press image gallery, trailers, optional English subtitles, six postcards of artwork from the films, reversible sleeves. Anyways, these, these are true gems. This is Locked AB. I would really recommend checking these out. All three of them were spectacular. If you like kind of samurai or period piece movies with good action then the with a great lead character, then this one's for you, Bounty Hunter. Okay, the next one here is from Fun City Films, and this is from 1983, and this is... Uh Deep in the Heart, um, like Deep in the Heart of Texas, or Handgun is the other title. So um, I had heard about this movie for a very long time, and I, I definitely wanted to watch it because it's not um, your conventional rape revenge film. And I guess when you say conventional, the the, the subgenre sort of has a, a thing that it's an exploitative subgenre, right? When you think I spin on your grave, Miss 45, Thriller, Cruel Picture, these movies, Last House on the Left, they all have an exploitative touch where they graphically show the rape scene. Now, from my understanding, Deep in the Heart wasn't necessarily that. It was something that took the subgenre subject a little bit you know i don't want to say more serious because those exploitation movies are very serious i would say a little less shocking in, in a lot of ways but it's still just as shocking so um just because it's such a well done drama so we have this this girl here she moves up uh, this teacher she moves from uh boston i think massachusetts to texas and it's a completely different place and they definitely kind of hit you over the head with that this this texas town this texas uh state is a gun country it's a big time gun country. Um, and she comes from the small little background of, you know, a religious, nice, good family. And she has like a, she seems more liberal, more like loving kind of deal instead of the kind of gun kind of thing. And, and the politics are completely different. I mean, it's funny, like how, how much, you know, they basically, the director is British and he obviously was infatuated with the idea how Americans are so into guns, how it's a big part of our culture. It's a big part of our history. And there's even a part in here where a character kind of, I don't want to say exposition dumps, but he basically gives a history lesson so she kind of gets involved with this guy who at first seems a little he's charming at first but every time you peel a layer back there's kind of like an ugly side a hateful side uh, a very much kind of a character that uh, is around today someone that is just uh, obsessed blindly with one thing and it lets him lead to this whole kind of this way of thinking and everything like that so uh, essentially he she doesn't want to get involved with him she said she just got out of a serious relationship and she doesn't want to get involved but they start to hang out more and more and, and like I said, he can be incredibly charming during dinner, but he'll, his politics will start to bleed through and he's just not on the same political spectrum as her. They're complete kind of opposites, but she doesn't really speak her mind. There's times when he drops slurs. I mean, at the time it was very common for these kind of slurs to be used and he shows his displeasure with things and, and whatnot. So like uh, that she would probably agree with. She never comes out and says it. But of course, as it, as it builds up, there is a rape where she doesn't want to go with him and he rapes her and the rape is off screen the buildup is there where he uses a gun and then there is a second rape uh, but the hardest stuff to watch it's all off screen rapes but after the first rape the way he talks to her and the way he acts like it's her psychological problems why she didn't want to have sex in the first place and he has that like a genteel voice he is so out of touch it is so bothersome and I have to say that both performances by the leads in here are fucking spectacular um, they're really well done they seem really natural so what our character does here instead of you know she goes to the police and you know the police officer explains to her that the way this happened there's just not it's not going to happen it's not going to work it reminded me a lot of lipstick in the way that they went to the police station and everything like that. But this one doesn't have the trial. Instead, she decides to do something else. She starts to kind of go to this gun club and infiltrate it. She starts to learn how to shoot. She becomes great at something that he loves. And it was just, uh, you really never know where the movie's going to go. Is she going to kill him? Is she going to what? And uh, there's some really great insight here because there's so many moments in this movie where our lead is talking to a character and you're like, this person seems charming enough, maybe a little off, maybe a little different. And then they go into this tirade or they slip and say something that's just really off. And you kind of see like the mental illness underneath um, the way of thinking the character who is just a survivalist. Like even if he believes, even if it does happen, the way he's talking about it, the way he's, you know, uh, fantasizing about it is just not healthy. And, and you're just listening to it. And you're just like, oh, man, have you, if you've ever had a conversation with someone, this movie's all about peeling away layers. And every layer that is shown uh, on somebody, it just it kind of exposes them who they are. And it exposes the kind of culture. There's a couple characters that come across completely fine within the gun community. So it's not everybody, you know, and there's there's a scene where she goes to buy a gun and that seems so natural. The guy who's teaching how to shoot the gun and the store clerk that they actually have to just be doing that job. You know, they legitimately do. And 
the history lesson he gives on guns is just such a important piece in the film because it sets up the history of America, the history of Texas, and the history of who these people are and where they come from and what the guns mean to him. And it means everything, you know. So all this stuff here is just really interesting. It's really well acted. I like how it plays out. It's completely different from anything you've seen. It's not your typical rape revenge film. I was, a Promising Young Woman was another one that was completely different. And I just, I like when they take these kind of subgenres that have a reputation and kind of subverse it and change it around, make it different. And this one was great. I, I really liked Handgun, aka Deep in the Heart. As far as special features are concerned, we have a new 4K restoration. Looks spectacular. Um, newly recorded audio commentary by Erica Stoltz and Chris O'Neill. Love that because they start going down the history of rape revenge. They talk about all the movies and how, you know, who is the actual person who gets the revenge and what difference it makes and all these kind of things like that. Archival interview with writer, producer, director Tony Garnett. And that's only a couple minutes long. He talks about gun culture in America. And not that he was really trying to even condemn it, but he was just infatu infa fa fantas um, like infatuated with it. Not infatuated, he was just very intrigued by the whole thing. But this is a great release from Fun City. Love this one. Deep in the heart. Uh, hang up. Check it out. I think you guys will like it. Okay, the next one here is from Egg for Films, and this is The Last Slumber Party. And this one here, uh, you know, I'd heard about it for years. It always had a reputation of being an absolute piece of crap. So EGFA releases a lot of strange films, some stuff that people would find unintentionally funny or just completely, utterly absurd or bizarre or different. That's kind of EGFA's MO. Now, the guy who runs EGFA, he doesn't, like like to laugh at the movies you know he, he says so himself in the q a but you know he has an intrigue in these kind of weird bizarre films so the last slumber party was one slasher that i had actually never seen so this is uh late 80s it was it was made a couple years before that so it didn't get released it has film but then it also has sob inserts in there because they were running out of money um this is a freaking mess I could see why some people would enjoy it. The dialogue is so bizarre. The line deliveries are super bizarre. The lead character is kind of an odd character that you would pick to be the lead, but she's also the most intriguing. Like, by the time you realize she's the final girl or the last one surviving, you're like, oh, it's her. Okay. But essentially what happens is a mental patient, somebody who cracks under pressure, escapes from a mental hospital, and uh, she, the doctor, uh, you know, is the main character, one of the main characters, like fathers of it, whatever. So the daughters are, you know, staying at his house and they're kind of having a slumber party of course guys are going to sneak in and they're going to try to party and uh you know mom's trying to sleep the whole time while the dad's at work and the doc the killer doesn't like the doctor that's why he goes to his house and starts picking people off of course um the funny thing is people are like don't they got to be quiet because they wake their mom and they're talking at the top of their fucking lungs i mean they're, 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 they're like hey, 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 hey. it's like and then one second we've got to be quiet it's like okay whatever that's kind of just funny shit like i said the dialogue delivery is so absurd most of the acting is atrocious. It's atrocious. Like, it's so bad. And it's not intentionally bad. It just makes the whole ordeal bizarre. Um, the special effects are, like, failing in the middle of the shot. Like, there's, like, a, a scalpel. And, you know, you cut the neck and the blood comes out of the scalpel. It's a, a simple effect. But they'll get halfway across the neck and there'll be no blood. And then they'll just, they, they fuck it. And then there'll be blood a second half. And they're like, that's the effect. It's a non-effect. And it's not done well. And they do it several times. There's a shot where the killer looks at the camera like eight times. Sometimes, like, I feel like they're breaking the 180 or the 360 rule, whatever the fucking rule is. It feels like it's been broken a couple times where I was just like, where is everybody here? What, what's going on? And, like, I know I'm nitpicking the shit out of this, and a lot of people like this because it's sheer absurdity. It's sheer bizarreness, and I can understand that. Sometimes that works for me. Like, look at Burial Ground. I love Burial Ground. It's absurd. It's weird. It's creepy. It's stupid. I just love it. It's it just got the right mixture of weirdness and, and absurdity and, and, and gore and everything and cheesy this one it doesn't work for me i think it's a bad movie i think it's a truly bad slasher film um now uh, some people will love it as an oddity it's worth watching i'm glad i watched owned it i really like the q a with the uh, owner of agfa and the lead actress the lead actress was aware of how weird and goofy the movie is and she was really smart and really fun and really nice so it makes me want to like the movie um the director's not really anywhere to be found which is pretty crazy um the ending is bonkers as well of course they're gonna have a stupid fucking ending on this thing we got a commentary with steven tyler star jan jansen and cast and crew member neil alexander in the q a 2016 with jan jansen so um yeah basically preservation of vhs version for one inch tape as well so this movie was actually released in japan before it made it here so there's also absurdity and weird stuff like the tv Anyways, uh, The Last Slumber Party is, you know, um, what was the one? Killer at 10 Killer or 10 Killer or whatever, Lake or whatever the fuck that one. Everyone was like, that's the worst slasher ever. I watched that on like 4K and I was like, I like this. It's pretty good. This one I watched, you know, was supposed to be one of the worst slashers ever. And it lives up to that.
that moniker. I mean, I didn't care for it. A lot of people still love it, and I can see why they like it. Just this one ain't for me, guys. This one really is not for me. They did really well cleaning it up as best as they could, you know what I mean? It does have SOV inserts, and they couldn't get all the elements, but man, this is the best it's going to have, right? I mean, it's the last fucking slumber party. There's, it, It's crazy that it's even on Blu-ray, really, you know? Okay, the next one is from Vinegar Syndrome, and this is a horror anthology, and this is from 1965, directed by Freddie Francis, legendary director who did Doctor and the Devils, Tales from the Crypt. He's a legendary cinematographer, worked for David Lynch, and this is, I say 65, this is the first Amicus anthology. Now, there'd be seven amicus anthologies and maybe two unofficials or three if you want to count the uncanny monster club and tales that witness madness they're not technically amicus so but they had i think the same producer milton zabowski or writers producer whatever you want to say so this one follows the story there's one two three four five stories in here and it's got the the guy here peter cushing and of course christopher lee donald sutherland and it's five stories five people enter a train uh six including peter cushing and he's super bizarre kind of guy and he has these tarot cards and right when Lee enters the train, he just looks annoyed. He looks like such a pretentious prick. This is one of my favorite Christopher Lee performances. A uh, 4K looks great, too. I mean, 65. So he enters, and he's just annoyed with everyone. He's just like, you morons. Basically, he sits down. So he starts to tell. Uh, of course, he gets to talking, and they talk about the tarot cards. They're kind of more... All the characters have different kind of personalities. Some are more jovial. Some are a little bit more uptight. Um, they seem to be from all different places. I mean, one's from Scotland. One seems to have an American accent. Donald Sutherland's from Canada, really, but maybe he's doing an American thing. So as uh, Peter Cushing starts telling them all their stories, of course, they have the last card, the Redemption. And we all know, is it, is it going to be good or bad? We know it's bad. You've seen these Amicus movies, right? You've seen Tales from the Crypt. You've seen Bolton. It's not good. It's not good at all. So essentially what happens is we have the first story, which um, it's a werewolf story. But it's, it's very gothic. It's very fun. It's about inheritance or a house that was taken away from a family inheritance and he's working on it. Uh, the twist is cool as well. This one's pretty enjoyable. The next one is the killer plant story, which I absolutely fucking loved because you don't get many killer plants. This one was creepy. It was just kind of scary. I mean, even Creep Show, which is kind of a, a thing on the Amicus and the EC Comics and Tales from the Crypt stuff, had a, a killer plant story. So that was really cool to see that pop up in a, that one. But this one's really fun, you know, in the vein of, of course, Day of the Triffids or something like that. But this one was cool in these vines and whatnot. Um, this is the problem with anthologies. You end up just rehashing the stories for everyone and telling you everybody your favorites. But then we have the third story here, which is a classic story that, you know, people getting involved with a culture and kind of exploiting it for their own needs, getting just desserts. That happens a lot in the Tales from the Crypt episode. So we have this guy here who's a musician and he's playing, I think, is he playing in uh, Haiti? And he basically, I think he's playing a place where West Indies or something where voodoo is very prevalent. He witnesses some sort of, you know, ceremony and he decides to try to steal the music and that backfires on him, of course. And then we have the fourth story here which uh, follows the story of Christopher Lee. And this is by far the best one. The, Michael Gow is in here as well, Michael Gow. Um, the problem with these stories is they're very predictable because, you know, this kind of was one of the ones that set the template for these anthologies, right? And then afterwards, we had all the Amicus ones afterwards. It tells in the Crypt shows. We had fucking Creep Show. We had so many, Trilogy of Terror. We had so many of these anthologies afterwards. This kind of is one of the first ones from that time frame. So, like, if you're watching it for the first time, you're going to be like, well, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. They are predictable, but they still are vastly entertaining and very much fun for me to watch. I love these because my attention span can be short time. So when I watch these anthologies, I'm always very happy with it. So this one was by far the best. I mean, Lee is this art critic and he tears apart Michael Gow. And Michael Gow makes an ass of him, and Christopher Lee gets revenge, unjustifiedly so, for sure. But this one is great. I mean, you can. Th there's a scene where he's holding up this paint and he's praising it, and you know who the artist is right away. And what's going to happen to him, you know exactly what's going to happen to him. And the last story falls Donald Sutherland, who is a doctor, and uh, he begins to kind of think that his wife may possibly be a vampire. This is a fun one. This is a good one. Sutherland's solid as well. You know, I'm thinking Sutherland actually was in Amicus and Hammer movies, too. He's in um, Die, Die, My Darling. He's in that one, and he's in a couple Amicus, isn't he? I think he's in, he's in this one for sure. I think he might be in another Amicus anthology. But, of course, the ending is great. Uh, they get off at the train station, think another anthology, Night Train to Terror, and you know exactly what happened. But, uh, overall, I really enjoyed watching Dr. Terror's House of Horrors. Did I even say the title, Dr. Terror's House of Horrors? Of course, after this, you'd have Asylum... You'd have uh, From Beyond the Grave, you have Tales in the Crypt, Vault of Horror, 
torture garden and what is the the seventh one that i am completely forgetting here house that drip blood those are the seven technical amicus anthologies technically i believe and then of course i named the three the uncanny monster club and tales that witnessed madness which aren't really technically um amicus anthology i don't know if somebody could argue but whatnot so as far as the special features are concerned we have of course um a commentary with freddie francis and moderator john Sothcott. i also really like that and then we have a new home for horror feature including never before seen interviews with actress Katie Wilde, second assistant director Hugh Harlow, prop man Arthur Wicks, continuity supervisor Pauline Harlow, and dubbing mixer John Allred, Tales of Terror, Arthur Stephen Thoreau on Dr. Terror's House of Horrors, House of Cards, and archival making of documentary, archival video interviews with actor Kelly Lynch, actress Ann Bell, and Jeremy Kep. Jeremy Kep's really great in the plant one. Archival audio interviews with writer producer Milton Sabowski and producer Max Rosenberg. English trailer, German trailer, Italian trailer, too expensive promotional image galleries. Anyways, love Freddie Francis, underrated director. Love all those guys, Roy Ward Baker, Freddie Francis, Terrence Fisher. They're all really good. Um, and uh, Dr. Terrence House of Horrors was really fun. In fact, I don't think I had ever seen this one. I've seen all the other ones. This was the only one that I had not seen for some reason. So, hey, check that off the list. Loved it. All right, we're going to hop to those 1982 movies. <laughs> things and you just attack me right now so some of you are still human this thing doesn't want to show itself it wants to hide inside an imitation it'll fight if it has to but it's vulnerable out in the open if it takes us over then it has no more enemies nobody left to kill it and then it's one you moved the cemetery, but you left the bodies, didn't you? You son of a bitch, you left the bodies and you only moved the headstones! You only moved the headstones!
stop it. There's no more time. You've got to stop. Please stop it. Stop it now. Turn it off. Turn it off. Stop it. 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 Okay, first up, um, I had seen this one years ago when I went through my VHS voyage, but it is The Black Room. It's a Vinegar Syndrome release, and boy, oh boy, did they clean this sucker up. Now, this director, um, he didn't do too many horror movies. This might have been his like only widely released film, but uh, this one's kind of very underseen. It always was in very shitty quality on VHS, very hard to see any goddamn thing that's going on. But uh, this is a pretty unique horror film. So we follow this husband who uh, basically one day sees this ad in a paper, and it says basically rent this dark room and he has these ideas that he's going to bring women to this dark room and sleep with them and he starts to tell his wife about it as if it's a fantasy as fake they have two kids and and you know he doesn't want to you know do these things to his wife he's more focused on his dark room being like you know his weird open fantasy thing where he can have all these sexual exploits the people that are renting the dark room are a pair of brother and sisters and the brother is very sick he has a blood condition and they're very bizarre almost incestuous and they take pictures of the dark room and the sex and everything like that and at the same time you know maybe some of those lovers of his he'll, he'll be fine but some of those lovers of his won't come be coming back because he needs this blood it's very bizarre these characters they're almost vampiric in a way um and uh the lead sister here was in conan the barbarian she plays the witch if anybody remembers that the one that tries to seduce arnold seduce arnold and she tries she tries to kill him she's in this and her performance is really bizarre um so essentially the wife does eventually find out about all this and this was probably my favorite aspect of the movie is the guy's jealousy when the wife decides to take out the black room and do some things um you'll notice chris o'donnell's in here that's from happy gilmore and dirty work and a bunch of other movies and um linnea quigley has a small role as a babysitter too so that's nice to add them i really like the wife's performance in here i think it's really solid i think her character's great and the husband is just such a creep because his interactions with his wife after he figures this out the cinematography is cool there's a lot of nice handheld shots um weird shots steady cam shots and stuff like that there's like a water in the very beginning like i said this movie is interesting the questions it brings up about you know cruising i guess you'd say and and these kind of pickups and and the jealousy and the, the fra ma fragile masculinity and the ending is completely bizarre and different too i, I really really like this one this is the second time watch and this is the first time i could actually see something so maybe it's a first time watch because the, the vhs was so dark but uh yeah finally it's super nice to see this thing cleaned up and it's such a bizarre ending and such a bizarre film it feels so american and in touch it kind of shocks me that the director is not originally from america but as far as the special features are concerned we have the other side of the mirror an interview with director ali keller acting on impulse interview with actor jeremy seldis getting revenge an interview with actress uh um, formerly Clara Perryman, Blood and Black Room, an interview with special effects artist Mark Schustrom, who's done a bunch, worked on Mutilator, if I'm not mistaken, working their asses off, an interview with production assistant Lisa Cronin, Bodies of Work, Nightmare USA, author Stephen Thorne in the Black Room, and the career of its writer Norman Thaddeus Vane. And there's a crazy story about him co-directing this thing, which is not necessarily true, but this is the Black Room. Excellent release, looks excellent. Um, recommended, if you've never seen the Black Room, I would check this one out if you like horror films. Kind of hidden gem. I would say it's a hidden gem, especially of 82 so far. Okay, the next one up from 82 is another one from vinegar syndrome and this is ghost nursing and you know this one I, I wasn't too familiar with i maybe heard about it in passing so it's nice to see a hong kong movie get a blu-ray release from vinegar syndrome never going to complain about that this one takes place in taiwan so what we have this woman who um basically is having down on her luck she owes a bunch of money so she kind of goes to taiwan to be with her sister and the lo bad luck doesn't stop there the first time she's there she has this job but there's this kind of like criminal guy that spots her and he's like well you're coming home with me and basically rapes her he rapes her not even basically she he all out rapes her with his goons and after that um you know the luck doesn't the bad luck doesn't stop there she's dating another rich guy and this guy wants um you know this this crime boss does not like it kill his goons kill this person and after that she decides that um she needs to some good luck and the producer of this movie actually talks about this in taiwan at the time you could adopt a ghost a, a ghost kid and it was supposed to bring you good luck. And that's what all the women of the night did in there. So that's when they decided to make this movie, which is bonkers to me. So, I mean, it's just the idea is that it's based on actual true things is really crazy to me because the Hong Kong movies are so bizarre and so weird. So essentially what happens is she decides to adopt this ghost. So she goes to this shaman-like character and she adopts this ghost. 
And, you know, at first it's, you know, drinking milk, getting mad when somebody sits next to her that shouldn't because that's where their seat is, you know, pushing like somebody down, all sorts. And then eventually it starts killing people. It kills the criminals, of course. It kills other people that get in her way. And before long, the they try to ex exercise this thing because it's kind of ruining her life and relationship that she's just started. But this thing jumps inside of someone and possesses them. So the last act of the film, it's an all out bonkers uh, possession film where our, our kind of one of our lead characters being possessed goes on a killing spree and kills a bunch of people in really bizarre ways and has this giant showdown with the shaman, which is very common in Indonesian horror, Hong Kong horror, and Taiwan horror. That happens in all these movies. And you, you'll even see it in some South Korean horror like The Wailing, right? We have the spell kind of standoff thing or the Mr. Vampire movies from the mid 80s and they talk about a lot of this shit in the special features too which I was happy to see but if you've seen any Hong Kong movies all these movies end with like this big kind of magic spell magic fight even seating of the ghost all these ones kind of do it but uh, this one is pretty entertaining there's a couple good kills in here there is kind of a lull after you know the, the crime guys are killed in between that and the final ending I think is kind of just a little slow but overall I thought Ghost Nursing was a pretty good one from 82 that I had never seen uh, as far as the special features are concerned we have uh, Cancer and Mandarin language and we have from Big Boss to Ghost Nursing 8 Minutes interview with actor Billy Chan it's actor sorry about that but he talks about working with Bruce Lee a little bit but mostly I really liked his interest on this movie talking about it talking about horror movies you know they're just fun they're fake and Ghost and Black Magic in Hong Kong Cinema 18 Minutes a video essay by Sam Deegan and she talks about all of the beginning of the early works from the Shaw Brothers chanting ghosts and stuff like that going all the way up to you know the more modern stuff and all these kind of spells and fights and Cat 3 and stuff it's a nice little video I say for sure but ghost nursing looks good sounds good you'll recognize music cues from death wish 2 and poltergeist so yeah crazy but good movie Okay, the next one is from Hong Kong as well, and this is He Lives by Night. And in the very opening of this movie, we have this amazing Giallo-style Dario Argento kill where this woman is leaving this club, and she goes through all these sheets that are hanging up in the street, and there's slices through it, and I was just like, oh boy, this is going to be crazy. This is such a good, creepy, and, and crazy kill. But, of course, it is a comedy, too. So then it gets super silly. It gets super, super silly, which is expected in a lot of Hong Kong films. It's very rare that uh, it's 100% serious. But we kind of enter Ken Chun, I think is his name. And this is the heavyset actor who is in every Hong Kong movie ever made. He's in Run and Kill. He's in The Beast. He's in Mob Flicks Patrol. He is in Murderer's Pursuers. Excellent actor. Besides Anthony Wong, he might be my favorite of the kind of Hong Kong actors. He's in so many films. He's very good in this. He plays kind of this goofy detective that has a thing for this this, this uh, radio DJ. Not radio DJ, but radio kind of person personality. So essentially, he's like a, a chief or a detective, higher up detective, and he's on this case. They find the body, and they realize that the killer is uh, st strangling them with stalking. So the killer has this MO. If he sees anyone with stalking, it's kind of like Red to Kill, which came out in like 94, like right where the killer sees like the stalkings like there was like oh they can't control themselves and the killer is a cross dresser so that probably be outdated for a lot of people you know offensive possibly but it stems back to something that happened to them with their wife cheating and it's 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 kind of bizarre kind of weird backstory thing you're like what the fuck's going on here but uh so the killer kind of focuses on of course our radio personality as does our police chief and one of the police officers. Everybody kind of defending for her, likes her and everything like that. So the police chief is trying really hard. That's where a lot of the silly comedy comes. These two cops are kind of competing for her. Like there's a, din a lunch scene where the, the lunches are getting stacked up. It's absolutely ridiculous, silly stuff. There's, there's scenes where he comes out dancing and it's just like, it does seem out of place. But again, this is very much a part of Hong Kong cinema. So you're used to it when you've seen 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 of these movies. You kind of can expect the silliness or weirdness or, uh, you know, the kind of bizarreness like that in these movies so so um this is much more silly than ghost nursing i would say that it actually is more of a comedy so uh as they start to figure out who the killer is they start to team up but there's a couple pretty pretty cool kills it's not overly gory or gratuitous but there is uh i think three three or four kills in here and they're all really well done um the killer is 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 scary i mean i like the killer in general at one point what's the song they sing that they sing in english and they're doing it but overall i like this movie i think the ending's really crazy too um it feels like there's some missing pieces too like um maybe some missing maybe in this cut i'm not sure like the killer shouldn't like all the cops decide to take off the uniform because at one point the, the killer gets in a police uniform and then like all of a sudden the killer has found out that they've taken their clothes off and they're just completely in their underwear as well although it does play like kind of a a, a assembly or re, re 
re, it's about recreating history what happened to him earlier if we look at the outfit but uh, there's a crazy scene involving a seven up machine which is awesome uh yeah so so overall the ending's really good we have a good cat and mouse and i'm not the biggest fan of cat and mouse but i thought this one worked really well and i really like uh kent uh ken in here the main character i think he's one the main police officer not main character and i like a sissy as well i like all the characters all the main characters are good they're solid they're entertaining this is a pretty solid kind of comedy giallo horror film from hong kong i would recommend checking it out if you haven't seen it he lives by night the next one is a really bizarre film. It does have an AK name, but I'm going to go by the easier name, of course. This is from New Zealand. This is The Scarecrow with John Carradine, of all people. Uh, yeah, so this is a coming-of-age story, and if I had to compare it to anything, I'd compare it to, like, Stand By Me meets Silver Bullet without werewolves. So there's a strange drifter that goes into town, and that's uh, John Carradine. Really creepy character. Really bizarre. Seems like a drunk. Starts hanging out with the mortician and a couple other people playing cards. And uh, soon enough, you know, people start ending up missing they end up dead um and it kind of follows the two kids here three kids really kind of young kids and a, a girl who's a little bit older and one of their sisters and in the very beginning somebody kills one of their chicks steals their chickens so they're out and about looking for the thieves who's like they think it's this local small gang of bullies very stephen king style bullies that stole their chickens so they're out there on the same night somebody's murdered somebody is uh is killed and as it goes on you, you kind of entangle these two stories of the kids getting caught up in that but it more focuses on the small town and a lot of the bizarre characters and it's definitely like a period piece kind of style thing i think it's in the 50s it, it sure feels like the fucking 50s um but so they're trying to figure out who this killer is and everybody's looking at them and and characters a couple characters disappear there's this really kind of tragic weird fire and it's just like an underlining weirdness of zany characters and everything like that honestly when i watched this i felt this feels very stephen king this feels very reflecting skin if anybody's ever seen that movie from 1990 it has these kind of elements like that overall i thought it was a really good movie i thought john carradine was incredibly creepy in it i thought the ending was good too um i thought there was good imagery i thought it was a great kind of coming of age kind of horror thriller movie and it's called the scarecrow i don't want to spoil too much um but there's one scene where there's narration of course and that just sets the tone for like coming of age story for me to be honest and the characters just like we'd never forget that play that, that whole thing and stuff like that just sets it up also reminds me of something wicked this way comes although it's not not supernatural but it does have a lot of these little touches in there that i think people will like and it predates a lot of those movies actually so yeah the scarecrow good stuff good performance by john carradine overall good atmosphere something you don't typically get to see as a new zealand coming of age story horror film so i would recommend checking this one out good stuff Okay, the Patreon pick was, I can't remember who picked this one, but uh, it's City of the Dead from 1960, starring, of course, Christopher Lee. Uh, and this was kind of like, a, was this produced by the Milton Zabowski? Yeah, so some people are like, this is technically an amicus. It's not really, but still. So this is an Arrow release. It has two cuts on there. I watched the original cut. I'd actually never seen City of the Dead, and I'd heard great stuff about it. Lots of thick with atmosphere. So essentially, Christopher Lee is a professor, and he talks about witches and superstitions and all these kind of things like that. And there's a student in there who's very interested in it. So she decides to go to this small town that Christopher Lee recommends, which is one of the most superstitious towns. It has a rich history in witches, and says, you know... I'll send you there, you know, you just tell them that I sent you, they'll let you stay in there and everything like that. So we pretty much know what's going on right away. The town is thick with atmosphere. It feels very much like, you know, Black Sabbath, the same year, 1960. So we have that going on. 1960 is gangbuster year for mil movies. You got Psycho, Eyes Without a Face, Peeping Tom, you know, Black Sabbath. You got so many good fucking movies, City of the Dead. So what happens is she goes to the small town, she starts to research, and everybody around is really bizarre. The, the, the guy running the church is blind, and he tells her to get the hell out of there the librarian is new it's the daughter of the guy who runs the church she just got in the town and she said kind of everybody's really bizarre here but uh you know the people at the lodge are, are bizarre too and then 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 Lee had explained this covenant of 12 witches and all these kind of things like that. This very much is the plot to like, you would see like an A24 movie, to be honest, or something nowadays, you know, which it's been done for years and it's always going to be done. But nowadays people are like, this is elevated horror. I mean, like the horror like this has been made for hundreds, of, you know, ever since horror is being made. It's just that, you know, in the 80s, everyone just think they were all slasher movies, which isn't the fucking case, you know, but still. Uh, anyways, what happens is she ends up disappearing, which is kind of a page out of Psycho, right? Because we think this is our main character. Uh, of course, we have, you know, her boyfriend comes looking for her and other people, her brother. All these people come looking for her at, at one point and they make it to the small town. They they interact with the, the, the librarian comes there too and interacts. And we know right away who's in on it. 
I mean, Lee sent her there, so Lee ends up showing up in the Covenant of Witches, and there's 13. Um, the ending reminds me of something straight out of Hammer, you know, like uh, if anybody remembers that Hammer Dracula, sometimes shadows and stuff like that. They, instead of just using the shadow of a cross, it is just the shadow of a cross that will kill them, which is crazy to me. I'm spoiling a lot here, but this has such thick atmosphere. I mean, literally, like, thick fog flowing all over the damn the place. Um, it looks really crisp, though. Cinematography is good. This is clearly built on, like, a set. Uh, they made this small little creepy superstitious town i'm not superstitious town like witch town i guess you say but overall i thought this was really good really entertaining really fast paced really uh, you know i mean it's obvious but you know just because it's obvious you don't it doesn't necessarily mean it's bad as long as they set it up well enough and they really do with city of the dead so i would recommend checking this out there is some whoa some features on here if i don't fall out of this damn chair so uh we got um high definition okay we have two presentations of the film the city of the dead and the alternate u.s cut horror hotel then we have optional English subtitles, audio commentary by film critic Jonathan Rigby, author of English Gothic Classic Horror Tales, 1897 to 2015, and Christopher Lee, the authorized screen history recorded exclusively for this release, audio commentary by actor Christopher Lee, audio commentary by director John Moxie, interview with Lee, interview with Moxie, interview with actor Venetia Stevenson, so it's got a bunch of stuff. This is a great release from Arrow. I don't know if it's still in print or not, but I would highly recommend picking up City of the Dead. Yeah! All right, let's do these questions, comments, concerns. Nick Mua from Belgium. Shark Knight 3D was a fun watch. I checked it out mainly for Sarah Paxton. I loved her in the Innkeepers and Last House on the Left remake. Sacrilege, I know, I know. Hey, the acting in the Last House remake is good. I just don't like the movie. And for Chris Zulka's butt, one of the best in the business. Great to see that a classic Amicus Anthology is getting a 4K release. I hope the other six will get similar treatment because previous releases were bare bones, alas. Questions. What's your favorite Owen Campbell performance to date? I can't quite decide between super dark times thanks for again for recommending that and Candyland, r.i.p levy probably Candyland, but i like him in super dark times as well he's always good though um your heart won't be unless i tell it to he's good he's always good do horror anthologies work better with or without a host to introduce each tale i felt like crypt keeper stick got a bit old uh, a bit old after a while um it all depends you know i mean if you can do it like tail i mean like um something along the lines of you know trick or treat i think it works best but if you can't i do think an, a host can really help with it as long as they're all made by the same person or the same group of people last thing i want is like six shorts made by six people in six different times in six different places on six different cameras now that sucks um but love the tie 1981 top 10 you guys are the mount rushmore of horror movie reviewers take care till next week no i think those guys are i'm just there along for the ride way up dude uh thank you it gives me a little heart josh fulci fan the forest was a lot of fun not a section three but slightly cut with uk vhs release maybe confusing with don't go in the woods which was a full ddp 39 nasty and has bizarrely been released as the forest two in a few countries no i knew about don't look go in the woods alone but i forgot i didn't remember the forest but thanks for the information thank you um, and then Coastline says, thanks, Josh. I was about to say The Forest was not on any UK seizure list. Gabby Roll, Peekaboo. A lot of these movies look intense, and I like your screaming toilet intro. Thank you, Gabe. Um, blank, where has Jeremy been lately? This is user UX. Um, yeah, and somebody says, asking the real questions. He, he might come on for a bit. I don't know. Doesn't want to do it as much. We're busy. Subjective Perspective Collective. I don't know why The Forest gets so much hate. The film jacked me up as a kid. I remember watching it at six or seven years old and lived in the backwoods at the time. Very unique slasher hybrid ghost story. Uh, and Kent is hella out of his mind. By the way, speaking of Agfa, have you ever reviewed Fuck the Devil and Fuck the Devil 2 Return of the Fucker? Love those titles. No, I have not. I have them, though. Uh, Zami Adams. Death Squad is a great sleaze fest. Agreed. Ken Coakley. I liked your review of The Forest. Gary Kent was a friend with whom I would talk endlessly about movies. The first time we communicated was with each other on Facebook via the chat in 2010 it was two days after the oscars he said that jeff bridges was a friend and he was happy for him gary also told me that richard rush was reading for woody harrelson the wind for rampant during the chat we talked about his movies and other movies we liked after the first chat he tried to contact my other facebook friends who knew me in person just to ask them if my movie knowledge was real or if i googled it two of my friends verified that it was real upon learning that in the next chat he told me that there were only two people who knew movies as much as myself they were quentin tarantino and peter bedonovich that was quite flattering i imagine he did more stunts and acting jobs, but he acted in some good exploitation movies. My favorite was Satan Sadus, which he was directed by Al Adamson. Another Adamson movie he was in was Dracula vs. Frankenstein. He also did brief appearances in Hell's Angel, Hell, on, Hell Angels on Wheels, The Savage Seven, and Psych Out, which were directed by Richard Rush. Psych Out had a star-studded cast, Jack Nicholson, Max Julian, who was the first choice for Marcellus Wallace, role in Pulp Fiction, Susan Strasberg, Henry Jalcom, Adam Warwick, Bruce Dern, and Dean Stockwell. Great cast indeed. So you know what? I only have four movies to do the update. 
I know I'm lazy. I'm just going to show them all here because I'm a lazy boy. First up is the Streets of Fire 4K from uh, Screen Factory. I don't think I had the Blu-ray. Fun Walter Hill movie. Um, it'll look good in 4K. It's got a lot going on in the frames and everything. Very colorful. Then we have some uh, Massacre video here. We have um, the films of Vince Roth and Mick Nards, the In Hell Productions. So there should be three films on here. Uh, Six Pack That Bitch, Necro, and Don't Go in the Fucking Woods. And uh, honestly, uh, Don't Go in the Fucking Woods and Six Pack That Bitch, I don't think they've ever really been released. So... I've seen, of course, Necro, which is a crazy, dark-looking movie. Weird, crazy movie. And then what else? We have a Roscoe the Embalmer on Blu-ray. This is a really good shockumentary. Uh, Well-made, uh, disturbing imagery, but also very interesting about, uh, I think, a Colombian uh, a mortician. And then we have Snuff 102 on Blu-ray. This one I've never actually watched. I saw parts of it years ago, and it just was bothering me. i definitely going to give it a watch or try to get through it, man. But this is supposed to be a pretty disturbing film. So, yeah, that is the update. So let's get out of here. All right, guys, thank you very much for watching. And as always, have a good one. Mm.